Chapter Eleven of the World's Lumber Room by Selina Gay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven: Vegetable Scavengers. When Professor Nordenskjöld was in the Arctic Ocean, he noticed that in one spot there were innumerable dead fishes. A shoal had evidently been entangled among the ice, and becoming enclosed in a narrow space. Had been drowned. But how can fishes possibly be drowned? Some one may ask. Well, a man drowns for want of air if his head be kept under water. For drowning is practically the same thing as suffocation, and the fish, though it lives in water, needs air as well as other animals. And being unable to decompose the water and so obtain oxygen. Is dependent upon that which is dissolved in the water. When that is exhausted, it must needs be suffocated. But why should not the same air be breathed over and over again? On one occasion, Monsieur Huber, having closed the entrance of a beehive, noticed that in a quarter of an hour the bees became uneasy, ceased working, and began vibrating their wings in great agitation. In about thirty-seven minutes, they were exhausted and fell down. Thousands strewed the floor of the hive, and all would have been suffocated had the experiment been continued. As it was, the admission of fresh air revived them. Evidently, therefore, the breathed air had been so altered as to be incapable of supporting life. When air passes into the lungs of an animal. Part of the oxygen unites with the carbon present in the blood and oxidizes or burns it, with the result that carbonic acid gas, carbon dioxide, is formed. Footnote: One atom of carbon and two of oxygen make a molecule of carbon dioxide. End of footnote. A similar thing happens when we burn wax, tallow, oil, gas, etc. All of which consist of carbon and hydrogen variously modified. Part of the oxygen of the air unites with the carbon, producing carbonic acid, and part with the hydrogen, producing water. The latter we can see by covering a bit of lighted candle with a tumbler, which will at once become clouded with dew. Footnote: When a lamp is first lighted, the glass, being cold, is similarly clouded. Until the dew is evaporated by the heat of the flame, end of footnote. But the flame burns as the animal breathes only while it has enough oxygen, and as there is but little in a tumbler, it goes out in a few moments. Not that the oxygen is entirely exhausted, but the proportion being too small, the flame is stifled. Hence, carbonic acid may be used for extinguishing fires. And one which had been burning in a coal mine thirty years was, in 1851, successfully smothered by this means. This carbonic acid is the refuse we are now to consider. This gas is one and a half times as heavy as the air, so heavy that it can be poured from one vessel into another. Yet instead of resting upon the earth, as we might expect. It mounts up and mingles with the other gases of the atmosphere. By heating twelve grains of carbon in thirty-two grains of oxygen, we produce forty-four grains of colourless gas, which, when frozen, resembles snow. Footnote: The black lead of our pencils is pure carbon. So also is the diamond. End of footnote. Ordinary air contains about one two thousand five hundredths of the gas, but there is much more in the air of our rooms, owing to the presence of fires and lights, as well as our own breathing. The air we breathe out contains from three to six per cent of carbonic acid, and not enough to keep a candle alight. A man breathes out about a cubic foot of the gas in an hour and a half. Nearly four and one third gallons per hour, and as one in a thousand is enough to make the air unwholesome, his breath alone would make the air of a room measuring ten feet each way unfit for respiration in that time, supposing it to be air tight. 
he would be able indeed to go on breathing some time longer but would feel drowsy and heavy two per cent of the gas would give him severe headache even one per cent is not long to be endured and ten per cent would stop his breathing altogether fortunately our houses are not air-tight but if we close our doors and windows cover all cracks and crevices with list and sandbags shut down the register or put a chimney-board before the fireplace and then sleep in a room ten feet square the amount of fresh air which can come in is so small that we must needs breathe what is unwholesome during the greater part of the night and it is no wonder if we awake with a headache and feeling unrefreshed the case is worse still if we keep the gas burning or even just a bead as some are fond of doing those who live in towns are so accustomed to breathe air which is not quite pure that they do not notice it unless it be worse than usual but an arab fresh from the pure air of the desert wears a frown of disgust when business obliges him to enter a town and usually goes about with cotton in his nostrils or a handkerchief drawn over his nose and if obliged to pass a night within the walls will at least not sleep under a roof it is computed that manchester with its large population and numerous furnaces engine fires etc produces some fifteen thousand and sixty six tons of carbonic acid gas every day and the inhabitants of london send up some eight hundred tons of carbon into the air in the same time yet all this great mass is quite invisible and has no share in producing fogs or darkness for the human furnace is happily so constructed as to consume its own smoke each full-grown person contributes on an average more than four ounces of solid carbon to the atmosphere in twelve hours but the gas is also generated by that slow burning of animal and vegetable substances which we call decay and it is poured forth in very large quantities by volcanoes and from cracks in the earth in volcanic districts there are more than a thousand carbonic acid springs in the eiffel and lake of lach district alone the various processes by which carbonic acid is produced go on chiefly in the northern hemisphere since that contains the larger proportion of land and as the old world is more densely populated than the new more carbonic acid must be produced in the east than in the west in the north than in the south yet the air all over the world in the plains and on the mountains is very nearly alike for gases possess the peculiar property of intermingling or diffusing themselves equally through one another without any reference to their comparative weights in this they are very different from liquids such for instance as oil and water for the oil will always rise to the top even if put in at the bottom of a bottle but if you put in first carbonic acid which is the heaviest gas then oxygen and finally hydrogen which is the lightest of all in a little while without any shaking they will have thoroughly mixed with one another footnote hydrogen is fourteen and a half times lighter than air End of footnote. carbonic acid is forty four times as heavy as hydrogen and one point five two nine heavier than air so that but for this law of diffusion it would rest upon the earth and if all the carbonic acid breathed out by four million londoners were thus to settle down they would soon be completely enveloped in it and suffocated as it is however except in particular localities the amount of carbonic acid present in the atmosphere is nearly everywhere the same and though it forms but a small proportion of the whole its entire weight amounts to more than three billion tons though constantly receiving additions the quantity does not increase thanks to the innumerable scavengers always at work removing it each blade of grass in the meadow every leaf in the field wood or forest is busy during every moment of sunshine in drinking in this to us poisonous gas 
and they do this so rapidly that there is actually rather less of the gas close to the earth's surface where it is generated than there is higher up one plant of colza rape for instance will drink more than two quarts of the gas in the course of one day's sunshine an acre of beech forest takes about three and a half tons of gas or one ton of solid carbon every year and if the whole earth were covered with beech trees the supply of gas would be altogether exhausted in about eight years supposing there were no means of renewing it as however three-fourths of the globe are covered with water and as the vegetation of the fourth quarter is less than a third of what it would be if covered with forest trees the present supply would last a hundred years it is the leaves not the roots of plants which take up carbonic acid for though the soil contains much plants can be grown and brought to perfection in water which is quite free from it provided of course the other food they need be supplied to them and they will be found to contain quite as much carbon as those grown in earth they must therefore take it from the air and as fast as they remove it from their own immediate neighbourhood its place is supplied by more in obedience to that law of diffusion already mentioned so that we may imagine streams of the gas to be constantly flowing towards every leaf and blade it must not be supposed that the breath and fires of england necessarily feed only the english crops and trees for then what would happen during the winter months when we have comparatively few scavengers to purify the air for us when it is winter here however it is summer in the south and thanks to winds and currents as well as to the movement of the gases among themselves our breath may go to feed the palms and sugar canes of the tropics while english oaks and english wheat are in their turn fed by the breath of africans and south americans when the leaves have attracted and absorbed the gas the sunbeams with their rapid vibrations tear the atoms of carbon and oxygen asunder the carbon is kept by the chlorophyll or leaf green to which the leaves owe their colour and nearly the whole of the oxygen is given back to be breathed over again and to purify the air of those organic impurities which besides carbonic acid are constantly being poured into it from the lungs of animals plants breathe by means of their leaves and if stripped of them will die but without the leaf green they cannot separate the carbon and to make leaf green they need iron in very small quantities it is true but if kept quite without it the plant like the human being grows pale and sickly it cannot digest its food and finally dies of starvation but the leaf green however healthy cannot do its work without sunlight and plants kept in the shade or even in rooms lighted only from one side give out carbonic acid instead of oxygen at all hours of the day and night plants give off carbonic acid but the quantity is so minute that in the sunlight it almost escapes notice whereas by night or in the shade they give off carbonic acid only even then however the quantity is so small that as has been said one might safely pass the night in a greenhouse without any danger of being suffocated by the geraniums such plants as the colza pea bean raspberry and sunflower exhale during a whole night only as much as they absorb during one quarter of an hour or twenty minutes of direct sunshine seaweeds as well as land plants perform the office of scavengers not only by absorbing carbonic acid but by giving out oxygen and dr hooker remarking upon the universality of the diatoms speaks of them as a most important feature of the polar seas where the higher forms of vegetation are so scarce that the office of purifying the waters devolves mainly upon them many fresh water plants among which the common duckweed is prominent are powerful purifiers whether their leaves float below or upon the surface and those who have kept aquariums will no doubt have noticed the little globules of oxygen which cover the weeds when the sun shines upon them 
by the oxygen thus evolved the impurities in the water are literally burnt up footnote mere exposure to the air will purify water to a great extent ozone or condensed oxygen generated by electricity is a yet more powerful consumer of all putrescible matter in the air the air of impure places is universally characterized by a want of oxygen and the differences though minute are exceedingly important to health according to dr hartwig the percentage of oxygen in the air of the metropolitan railway underground is twenty point seven in the east end of london twenty point eight five seven pit of a theatre twenty point seven four hyde park twenty one coast of scotland twenty point nine 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 suburb of manchester wet day twenty point nine eight suburb of manchester dry day twenty point nine four seven sitting room twenty point eight nine mine twenty point one four end of footnote the carbon taken up by plants is in some unknown manner combined by them with oxygen and hydrogen to make cellulose the colourless material of which all young vegetable fibres are composed it is to be seen in the skeleton leaves sometimes picked up in winter with all the fleshy part decayed away and only the bare bones left it is seen again in calico linen and paper which white as they are have only to be held near enough to the fire to be scorched and the carbon is revealed at once cotton wool again is almost pure cellulose about one half the substance of all wood fibre is simply carbon but it is not all used up in these ways and the immense variety of vegetable substances composed of the three elements carbon hydrogen and oxygen is amazing first there are the vegetable oils palm olive rape linseed etc all are hydrocarbons as these compounds are called and the acids which give them their characteristic flavours are hydrocarbons also from the same materials combined in different proportions the sugar cane beetroot maple and mallow produce their cane sugar the vine and other fruit trees their grape sugar and the acacias their gum arabic from the same again the lemon produces its citric acid the vine its tartaric the sorrel and lichens their oxalic the rhubarb its malic and the nettle the formic acid which makes its sting so painful all the vegetables used as food contain from forty to fifty per cent of carbon and foremost among these are the cereals the starch sugar gum and oil of whose grain are all hydrocarbons one pound of flour contains on an average seven ounces of carbon the various pines and firs combine carbon with hydrogen only and produce turpentine the lemon bergamot pear lavender pepper chamomile clove etc do the same and even in the same proportions and produce the essential oils which help to give them their special scents and flavours while the laurel of china and japan adds an atom of oxygen and produces the white crystalline gum known as camphor various tropical trees combine carbon with hydrogen and form such juices as india rubber and gutta percha which though white as they flow from the stem turn black and solid with exposure to the air and then other plants again such as the rose tonquin bean meadowsweet and many others convert the same two elements into the sweetest perfumes by the addition of oxygen but there is another gas of which the vegetable world relieves us and makes good use this is ammonia which like carbonic acid is produced by the decay of animal and vegetable substances and is easily known by its strong pungent smell it is a compound of hydrogen and nitrogen and is always present in the air but does not on an average amount to more than one part in fifty millions and though as it streams up from all decomposing organic matter it is naturally more abundant in the air of towns and cities 
the supply from this source falls far short of the demand. For all plants require nitrogen, and without it those used for food would lose their nutritive qualities. Yet though there is an unlimited supply of it in the air, they are unable to take it up with their leaves, except in the compound forms of nitric acid, nitrogen, hydrogen and oxygen, and ammonia, nitrogen and hydrogen. From 2 to 21 pounds to the acre are washed down from the air on an average every year, but a single acre of clover hay requires about 108 pounds, and in 28 bushels of wheat there are 45 and a third pounds of nitrogen. The remaining quantity is, therefore, derived from the decay of animal or vegetable matter naturally present in or added to the soil. Vegetables, then, derive all their nourishment from the air and from the soil, and convert gases and minerals into food for the animal creation, which is altogether dependent upon them for its means of subsistence. But there is one group of vegetables which are like animals in this respect, that they must have animal or vegetable matter to feed on. These are the fungi, and wherever they are seen, there we may be sure is some decomposing organic matter. Fungi do not contribute to the purification of the air by taking up carbonic acid, for they resemble animals in their way of breathing as well as of feeding. But they are scavengers, and some of them, such as the mushroom, are very perfect ones, since they convert refuse into wholesome food. Those which grow upon decayed wood are, however, very unwholesome, and others are not only poisonous, at least to man, but so offensive that they cannot be considered any improvement upon the refuse to which they have given a new form. Mr. Cook mentions one, the scent of which became in an hour or two worse than that of any dissecting room, and was perfectly intolerable until wrapped in twelve folds of thick brown paper. Still, what is disgusting to us is doubtless savoury to others, for many of the beetle tribe are entirely dependent upon the fungi for food. Wherever decaying vegetable matter of any kind is met with, there fungi are sure to be present, hastening on the process and growing so rapidly that a crop of toadstools will spring up and a puffball grow prodigiously in a single night. They are not even particular about growing in the light, and are found in mines growing on the wooden pegs driven into the walls for purposes of measurement, and at one time there was a specimen on the woodwork of the tunnel near Doncaster which measured fifteen feet across. No substance, animal or vegetable, comes amiss to them, and they will grow on and consume the defunct members of their own race. In New Zealand there is a certain caterpillar which, after swallowing the spores of a fungus, buries itself in the ground and dies. The spores take root in it, and the fungus, growing and absorbing the entire contents of the skin, takes the exact form of the creature, but always throws out a joint at the back of the head. It looks exactly like a caterpillar with a twig growing out of it, and is as hard as wood. The spores of the fungi, which answer to the seeds of other plants, are microscopic, even the largest of them, and the smallest are hardly visible when magnified 360 times. Their numbers are so enormous that one single plant may produce multitudes such as the mind cannot realise, and being so extremely minute, clouds of them are constantly suspended in the air, ready to settle and take root on any suitable soil, such as jam, paste, cheese, or even an old boot if left in a damp place. As long as this blue-green mould grows on the surface of a mass of paste, it can obtain from the air the necessary oxygen. But if buried in it, it does not die, for then it decomposes the starch of the flour, takes its oxygen, and gives off bubbles of carbonic acid. The bubbling, which we call fermentation, is, according to Professor Tyndall, just life without air. 
the yeast plant, another of these ferment-producing fungi, and the only one which can be said to be cultivated, produces hardly any fermentation if allowed to grow on the surface, where it gets oxygen from the air. But if buried in the wort, it has to decompose the sugar in order to obtain it, and fermentation proceeds so rapidly that streams of carbonic acid flow over the sides of the vat. A drop of yeast the size of a pin's head increases enough to ferment a pint of liquid, alcohol as well as the carbonic acid and a small quantity of glycerin being formed in the process. Yeast mixed with dough has a similar effect. Part of the starch is transformed first into sugar, then into carbonic gas and water, and the gas, in its efforts to escape, makes the minute bubbles which render the bread light and spongy. In making aerated bread, carbonated water is used instead of yeast, with the same effect, and with the advantage that there is no loss of starch, and no products of decomposition are left in the bread. Footnote. The use of the word leaven to denote a good influence seems strangely inappropriate in the face of these facts and the circumstance that Quote, leaven in the inspired writings is always taken as the type of naughtiness and sin. End quote. The most prominent idea connected with leaven is that of corruption, but this idea was not peculiar to the Jews. The priest of Jupiter was forbidden to touch flour mixed with leaven, and the Romans sometimes used the word fermentation for corruption. Quote, the radical force of the word matzot, unleavened, is sweetness or purity. End quote. Smith's Dictionary. End of footnote. There are many other vegetable ferments, most of which are, however, unpleasant. Some produce maladies in beer, some acidity, some putrefaction, according to their various ways of feeding. But though each has a flavour peculiar to itself, the character of all is essentially the same. When we like their effect, we call it fermentation. When we do not like it, we call it putrefaction. The name of bacteria is given to a large variety of these organisms, which, though much lower down in the scale of life than the mildew on decayed wood, are yet nearly allied to the fungi. They are the agents of all putrefaction. And though no microscope is powerful enough to detect their germs, they are bound in all the moist places of the earth, and being so inconceivably minute that a grain of pollen is gigantic in comparison, are not only easily lifted into the air by the wind on a dry day, but are even drawn up with the water as it evaporates. It is evident that all putrefaction is caused by them, for milk, meat, etc., which remain perfectly sweet for an indefinite time if the air be excluded or filtered through cotton wool, will be found swarming with bacteria in a few days if exposed to ordinary air. There are billions of them in the air of most London rooms and on all exposed surfaces, even on the money which passes from hand to hand. When developed, they are for the most part colourless and transparent, are constantly dividing and subdividing, and exist either singly or joined together in chains. Though in size they vary from the 350th to the thousandth part of a millimetre, one millimetre is less than one twenty-fifth of an inch, they are exceedingly tenacious of life, like other of the lower organisms, and in the germ state can bear great extremes of temperature without being killed. They may be boiled and they may be frozen, and though unable to germinate under these conditions, the life in them will not be extinguished, but after lying dormant, perhaps for months, they will become active as soon as a favourable opportunity offers. Oil of hops and carbolic acid, however, they cannot withstand. Many of the diseases which attack human beings and animals, splenic, typhoid, scarlet fevers, etc., have now been clearly traced to the agency of bacteria, and it seems probable that whooping cough, measles, chicken pox, and other infectious disorders are also the result of their attacks. Footnote, the fumes from carbolic acid sprinkled on a heated shovel are found to cure whooping cough very quickly. End of footnote. 
they increase with extraordinary rapidity, one germ being capable of producing in 24 hours 16 million bacteria, which, when fully developed, can only just be seen by the aid of the most powerful microscope and with all the appliances of artificial light. Footnote. 30,000 million cholera bacteria, or comma bacilli as they are called from their shape, occupy the space of a pin's head. End of footnote. It is no wonder, says Dr. Fürst, that infection should spread when we realise that the air of a sick room is loaded with germs so minute that hundreds may adhere to the smallest particle of skin, that they may settle in the hair, on clothes and books, may be carried away in numbers by the flies and deposited on food or anything else upon which they next alight, and unless expelled by carbolic acid, may remain for months in carpets, bedding, etc. Even a bright silver spoon which has been used by a sick person will probably have germs adhering to it until properly disinfected. People are more alive to the dangers of infection than they were, and Dr. Fürst mentions, as an instance of official caution, that a telegram sent from Alexandria during the last cholera epidemic was detained twenty-four hours on the way to be properly fumigated. But we must not regard even the bacteria as purely useless or mischievous. They are, says Dr. Tyndall, noxious, like many other things, only when out of their proper place. In their place they exercise valuable and useful functions as the burners and consumers of dead matter, animal and vegetable. They are not all alike, and it is restricted classes only that are dangerous to man. There is no respite to our contact with the floating matter of the air, and the wonder is not that we should occasionally suffer from its presence, but that so small a portion, and that diffused over wide areas, should be deadly to man. End of chapter 11